It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to turn off this fan here. There we go. I know it's louder to me than it is to all of you. But... All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, as we begin today, I'd like you to take a few moments to consider the following questions about your personal walk with the Lord. I'd like you to ask yourself, what is the state of your relationship to God as compared to a year ago, let's say? And, and, and if you're not sure how to measure that, there are a few metrics I could offer. Um, what is the condition of your prayer life today as compared to where it was a year ago? Um, what is your relationship with the Word of God in regards to how frequently you are taking it in and meditating upon it and studying it today as compared to a year ago? What is your relationship like with other believers, your friendships in the Lord? What are those like today as compared to where they were a year ago? Those are just some ways that you can ask yourself that question. Essentially, what I'm asking you to consider this morning is what is the trajectory of your spiritual life? Because if that trajectory is not where you want it to be, then I would suggest that maybe it's time to make a change and to reevaluate where you are and where you're heading. Now, the church in Corinth was a church that had been planted by the Apostle Paul. He had spent about a year and a half ministering there, as we read in last week's study, as we went over the first nine verses. And, and he's now moved on. He, he's moved on to new areas, to new regions. Uh, and he's, he's ministering at this point in time, as he's writing this epistle, in the city of Ephesus, where he had planted a church as well. And he was there in Ephesus for about three years. Now, of course, there was a good deal of commerce and a good deal of trade and travel that would go back and forth between Corinth and Ephesus, as both of them were, were major cities, and there was a lot of, of trade along this, this route and in these areas. And, and, and word had come to Paul through some friends about some things that were going on there in Corinth, and he was concerned. And at some point, a letter actually comes from the Corinthians, from the church there in Corinth. And Paul is replying to their letter and he's replying to their questions, but he's taking the opportunity in the process to correct some things that, that he has heard that are happening there. Now, we covered the first nine verses uh, last week, but for the sake of context this morning, I'm going to start in verse 1 as we read. Just know that if you'd like a more in-depth background of the book of Ephesus, you can go online and check out last week's study. In verse 1, we read, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, in essence, the address, right? This, this is the address that would go on the outside of our envelope saying who it's to and who it's from and where it's going, right? And, and, and Paul accomplishes a lot, even theologically, within these few verses. First of all, he lets us know that he is an apostle of God, that he was sent by God. Now, these, these words here, there are a few words that the Bible translators have added in. I'm always a bit sketchy about words that get added in, but we have to recognize that the flow of language is different from one language to another. And in order to have things make sense to our ear and to our eye, sometimes a few words have to be added. But the words that are added in this passage are the words to be, and it's added twice, right? Um, and, and I want to point those out to you. First of all, in verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle. Those words to be are not in the original language. It would read, Paul 
called an apostle, right? So Paul was called by God, an apostle, and he was sent by God. That's what the word apostle means. And he was, a, he was an apostle who was sent to the Gentile nations by Jesus Christ himself. He wasn't an apostle because he had been appointed by the other 11. He wasn't an apostle because he had been voted to be one by some church board somewhere. He wasn't an apostle because he had woken up one morning and decided, hey, I think I'm going to be calling myself an apostle from now on, right? I used to, I used to work at, at, at AT&T and I worked in a call center setting up phone service for people. And I would have people call in and they would give me their name and they'd, I'd have to type their name in just like they wanted. And, and I, I'd have a guy every once in a while and he says, no, no, it's Reverend so-and-so. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm Reverend so-and-so. Fortunately, I never had anyone call in and say, I'm Apostle David or Apostle John or whatever, right? No, you know, Paul was called an apostle not because he decided he wanted to be one, but because God called him an apostle, someone who was sent someone who was given a mission. Now, of course, I don't want to ignore Sosthenes, our brother, because Paul didn't ignore Sosthenes, our brother, so I'll address that. It is quite possible, though by no means certain, that the Sosthenes that is referenced here is also the Sosthenes that was referenced in Acts chapter 18 that we read last week, which means this was the man who had become the ruler of the synagogue there in Corinth after Paul had started the church there, and that he had actually brought accusations against Paul to the governor and had been beaten by the people for his troubles. I can imagine the story that played out there. Paul seeing this man in these straits and having compassion on him. And that compassion in turn leading to an opportunity to share the gospel. And now Sosthenes, no longer the leader of the synagogue, is Paul's traveling companion here in Ephesus. And quite likely the secretary who transcribed this letter back to the city of Corinth where he had previously been ruler of the synagogue. Is that what happened? I don't know. But I know it's the same name. Of course, it could be that it was just another, another person by the same name, but the movie in my head likes to play it out the way that I just described it to you. Now, this is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and it's to the church of God, which is at Corinth. To those who are sanctified, they are set apart, they're hagios, they are set apart, not just set apart from the world, but set apart to God. I used last week the illustration of a donut. You remember that illustration? I remember that illustration. I haven't had a donut in a year and a half, and I remember that illustration quite well. <laughs> if I take a donut out of that box and I set it on the counter, it is set apart, right? right. It is set apart from the other donuts that are in the box, but it is also set apart to someone. Not me, because I'm not going to eat the donut, but it's set apart to whoever the donut is for. Does that make sense? And in the same manner, we as believers are set apart from the world, but we are also set apart to the Lord. We are not separate for the sake of separateness. We are separated from the world because of the fact that we are consecrated to God. And so this is to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. No, 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 not called to be saints, called saints. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are saints. Doesn't take a church council, doesn't take any number of miracles to be performed in our name. No, we are saints the moment that we believe. Now, it's written to the saints there in Corinth, but not just to them, but also to all of those who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So in other words, not only are the believers in Corinth called saints, but we who believe in the name of Jesus Christ are also called saints. And the things that Peter, Peter, excuse me, and the things that Paul is teaching, are te the things that Paul, the things that, I'm an English teacher and I can't figure that out. The things that are being taught by Paul in this letter, I found a way to say it, are not just to them, they're also to us. Amen? They're also to us. And this also is to us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we know that grace always comes before peace because without grace, there can be no peace. Without the grace of God, we cannot be at peace with God. And if we are not at peace with God, then we cannot experience the peace of God. 
And so that unmerited favor that we did not deserve is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And as a result, we have peace with God. So this is the greeting. It's, it's who the letter is from, who the letter is to, and it is the greeting with which Paul begins. Now he goes into a section in verse 4 where he is going to give thanks to God for them. And I want us to pay attention to what it is he's giving thanks for on their behalf. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful prayer of thanksgiving. Let me ask you, do you give thanks to God for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you give thanks to God for the relationships and the friendships that you have here in this church? Do you give thanks for Calvary Chapel Southwest Metro? I hope that you do. And as the pastor, I give thanks for you. I'm very thankful that you are here this morning. You know, I remember years ago, and I don't want to get too far afield on this little uh, illustration, but... I remember a number of years ago, I guess at this point, it was about 22, 23 years ago, I, I was working with Calvary Chapel Fort Worth, and we were doing an outreach fellowship at a church on Pruitt Street in the hospital district of Fort Worth. And, and we had a few families that were coming, and we'd had a few people from the church that were there, and, and we had a church building that we were meeting in, and and uh, I remember we had come to the point where the church, Calvary Fort Worth, they had pulled back from that ministry, but the Lord had put it on my heart to continue it at least for a time independently with their support and encouragement, but kind of doing it on my own. And, and I remember one Sunday morning, I mean, I, I, was, I was the worship leader, I was the pastor, I, everything that needed doing, I was pretty much doing. I had a few folks that ha had agreed to help, but I was there. And I was there that morning and I had my sermon all ready and I had worship set all ready and the sound, every, everything was ready to go. We were, it was time for church. And I looked out into that congregation and there was no one there. There was just an empty building, empty pews, no congregation. I stepped outside to see if maybe somebody had, was just running late, you know, and was parked in the parking lot. And I stepped outside and there was that crumbly old asphalt parking lot and mine was the only car in it. That was disheartening, you know? That was hard. And ever since that day, if I have one person that shows up, I'm like, praise Jesus, I'm not here by myself, right? <laughs> so I give thanks for you. And, and, and whether or not you understand it, whether or not you know it, it encourages me when you are here. And that's how it's supposed to be, right? We encourage one another. I encourage you, you encourage me, we encourage each other in the Lord, amen? And, and uh, if it's for me, take a message. <laughs> and so as we look at this, we can see that Paul is giving thanks, but what is he giving thanks for? He's giving thanks for the grace that they have received from Jesus Christ. He's giving thanks for the fact that they have been enriched in everything by Jesus Christ, in all utterance and in all knowledge. These folks here in Corinth fell short in no spiritual gift. God had blessed them abundantly and he was confirming the testimony of Christ in and through them. In other words, Paul had preached the gospel to them and their faith in that word that was spoken, their faith in God through Jesus Christ was itself a testimony to the veracity of the gospel that was preached to them. In other words, they were the evidence that God had sent Paul to do this ministry. For God had said to Paul, I have many people in this city. And many people had come to faith and God was working in and through them. And Paul had confidence, as he says in verse eight, that God would confirm them to the end, that they would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that an incredible promise? That God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which is what we read in verse nine. Doesn't say you're faithful. 
doesn't say I'm faithful. Paul isn't saying he's faithful. Paul is saying God is faithful. And God is the one who is going to confirm your faith. God is the one who is going to confirm the relationship that you have with him through Jesus Christ. So that on that day, when we stand before Christ at his coming, we will be, we will be without condemnation. We will not need to be ashamed. Amen? He is faithful. We will be blameless in that day. Amen. So we come now to verse 10, which is where we really begin our our study today. In verse 9, Paul pointed out that it was God who was faithful and that he has called the believers into fellowship with his son, that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the one through whom we have fellowship with God. And the word for fellowship here is the word koinonia in the Greek, which is also translated as communion. And it communicates, among other things, the ideas of fellowship, association, joint participation, and community, okay? So God has called us in Jesus Christ to have fellowship with him and with one another. That, in a sense, we're all in this together, yes? That there is community. And let me tell you something. That is something that I don't think the world understands. And sadly, I think it's something that often we as Christians don't understand. And that is that we are called into a community of faith, right? That we actually need each other, right? That, 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 wow, amazing, we like and even love each other. Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples by your what? By your love for one another. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's our love for one another that bears witness to the world that we truly are disciples of Jesus Christ. And God has called us into that fellowship. But so often we, we look at church and our participation in the local church as, as a commodity to be consumed rather than as a relationship to be nourished, right? Uh, you know, when we choose a church, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody who's church shopping or anything like that. I've done my fair share. I know when I first moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, we went and visited the Calvary Chapel that was there, but it didn't have what we were looking for. We had two teenage girls living with us, my sister-in-law and my wife's niece, and, and we needed a place with a youth group, and they didn't have a youth group. And so we went out and we were searching here and there and everywhere. And we visited probably 12 different churches over the course of a year. And we found some with youth groups, but either they weren't teaching the word in the way that we needed the word to be taught, or maybe they were too far away, or maybe they had problems with their children's ministry. There was always some reason not to continue to attend those churches. And in the end, the Lord spoke to our hearts and he says, okay, look, You know that at the Calvary there in Las Cruces with Pastor Bob Ortega, they're teaching the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. They are teaching the word of God. And regardless of whatever else is or isn't going on, you know that's what you need, right? So the Lord put it on my heart that if there was something missing in the church and I recognized that there was something missing in the church, then maybe God was bringing me to that church so that I could help provide what was missing, right? And so I'm like, okay, we're committed. We're going back. So we went back to Calvary Chapel, Las Cruces, and we were home. And guess what? When we got there, they had a youth group. There was one that had developed in the interim, but God opened up doors of opportunity because our hearts were different when we returned. We were no longer consumers. We were contributors. We were no longer looking at what the church could give to us but rather we were trying to discern how God intended us to contribute to the health and the welfare of the body of Christ in that place. So we were no longer consumers, we were part of a community. And that's what God has called us to be. That's what God has called you to be. If God is calling you to Calvary Chapel, Southwest Metro here in Joshua, and I'm not saying that he is, only God can tell you whether or not he's calling you here. But if he's calling you here, he's not calling you here to simply sit and be a consumer. He's calling you here to be a part of a community of faith. Amen? 
to establish relationships, to grow together in the grace of God. And as, as Paul writes in verse 9 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, there was a problem in Corinth. And that was that they were not living according to the truth of that relationship. They were not walking in unbroken fellowship with one another and with God because divisions and contentions and arguments had come into the body and Paul is going to have to address it now. Now I plead with you, brethren, I'm, he's, he's, I'm begging you, right? Now, Paul, as an apostle, had the authority to command them, but he doesn't take that approach. Instead, he implores them. He pleads with them. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is pleading for spiritual unity within the body of Christ. And let me tell you, Paul is not alone in valuing this unity in the scriptures. We see this unity extolled. We see it, we see it lifted up and encouraged again and again and again in scripture. We're just going to look at a few of them real quickly before we move on. Turn with me, if you will to the 133rd Psalm. It's only three verses long. We won't be here for too long. I'm just going to read it without a whole lot of commentary because it speaks for itself. Behold, David writes, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And let me tell you, if you've been on Facebook or if you've been watching the, the, the news feed on the app, you probably saw some pictures of our men's fellowship down in Houston, right? Those were some guys who were really blessed to be together. I mean, when you look at the picture and you look at their faces, they actually seem to like each other, <laughs> right? They're not faking that, by the way. That wasn't just say cheese and then everybody grumbled and went off their own way. No, they genuinely enjoyed being together at that conference. And it was a blessing to see. So David writes, how good, behold, how good. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like... And you can see him searching for a simile here. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Listen, Unity in the body of Christ, unity and fellowship, it is life, it is joy, it is peace, it's a blessing. How good and how pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. And let me tell you, when you have a church body that has come together and there is unity in that body, there is unity in fellowship, there's unity in decision, there's unity in effort, there's unity in action, there's unity in ministry, it is a good thing, it is a blessed thing, and man, it is a happy place to be but you let just a little bit of division creep in there. You let just a little bit of contention creep in there. You let just a little bit of grumbling and complaining and backbiting, and before you know it, you've got a full-blown problem on your hands. And it is no longer good and pleasant, amen? But it's difficult, it's hard. Turn with me from the words of David to the words of the apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. Would have helped if I'd marked my place. First Peter chapter three. We'll start. Ah, oh, there it is. My tab got folded over. 
1 Peter chapter 3, we'll look at verses 8 and 9, maybe a little further, who knows. Peter writes, Finally, all of you, be of one mind. Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Yes, yeah, is a basic thing. Be courteous, right? Think about that. Maybe, maybe you can't agree with someone, or maybe you can't have compassion for them. Maybe you can't be tender-hearted. Maybe you have a hard time loving them as brothers. Can you at least be courteous? Right? Can you be courteous? We're called to all of these things. What does that look like? It looks like what we're told here in verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. That implies a certain degree of effort on our part, doesn't it? You're not just to seek peace, you're to pursue peace. And notice he said, don't return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. In order to not return something, then it has to have been given in the first place. So we can't walk into this with the attitude of, well, I'll be nice to them if they're nice to me, or I'll show them respect if they first show me respect, or I'll be loving to them if they're first loving to me. No, if they are disrespectful, if they are unloving, our response is not to be in kind, but rather in kindness. Ooh, that's good. We should remember that, right? When, when someone treats us badly, when someone treats us poorly, we should not respond in kind, but we should respond in kindness. Amen? Respond in kindness. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. In other words, God's watching. God's watching. Treat other people kindly, not just because they do or don't deserve it, but because you're doing it as unto the Lord. Because the eyes of the Lord are are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who, will, who, who do evil. Amen? The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Uh, Paul, of course, would speak of this as well. Um, we've seen what David had to say. We've seen what Peter had to say. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4 and follow up with the words of Paul. And let Paul comment, comment on things that Paul has already told us in 1 Corinthians. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, Paul writes these words. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. Amen? So why should I be at unity with you? It's because the same Holy Spirit that dwells inside me, if you are also a believer, dwells inside you. He's one spirit. And if I'm seeking him, and if you're seeking him, then we should be moving in the same direction, right? Oftentimes in marriage counseling, I've used this illustration. It's the illustration of a triangle, right? And we think about the triangle with its three points and its three lines there. And if you start out with the husband on one corner and the wife on the other corner and with God at the top corner, and you think as husband and wife, you want to get closer together, right? And so you could focus on just getting closer together along that line. But think about this. If instead of trying to get closer to each other, you both tried to get closer to God, what happens? you both get closer to each other, right? And so as believers, if we are following after God, if we're walking in close fellowship with God, then the consequence would be that we grow closer together in unity, amen? Because we're treating each other with the love and the respect and the kindness that God has called us to. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 1 as we continue with that chapter. So, in verse 10, Paul has pleaded with the Corinthians, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That, that phrase, perfectly joined together, in the Greek is a medical term for the setting of a broken bone or the bringing back into place of a dislocated joint, right? It is the idea of setting in place that which is broken so that healing and strength can take place. Amen? Now, maybe you're in a situation in your Christian walk where you have experienced a broken relationship with someone, with another believer. And you're like, I don't know how that can ever be healed. I don't know how that can ever be fixed because they've hurt me and I've hurt them and we've offended one another. But you know what? If you will allow God's grace to flow into that situation, if you will not respond with evil for evil, but instead you will respond with kindness, and if both of you will submit yourself to the Lord, then that can be perfectly joined together again. And healing can take place in that relationship. And perhaps I stretch the metaphor a little too far, but I'll say it anyway. Do you realize that a broken bone is strongest in the point at which it's healed together? That bone, once broken and it heals together again, it's actually less likely to break in that same spot again. Now, I'm no medical professional, but I think I'm right, aren't I? That, that healing that takes place forms a stronger relationship. And when we as believers, look, uh, uh, th- wh- wh- where's, where's my brother Philip at? Philip's in the back. I'm going to use him as an example. Philip and I, we've been around together for a while, and there were a time or two where we had disagreements. There were things that we actually kind of argued about a little bit. But you know what? We both submitted to the Lord, and we treated one another with kindness, and that relationship healed in such a beautiful way that I... I'm not afraid of offending Philip, and Philip's not afraid of offending me. Do you know why? Because we both know that if we do offend each other, it's just a momentary thing because we both love each other in the Lord. That's my brother. You know what I'm saying? And so once you get past that, oh, my goodness, what if I offend that person? Oh, my goodness, that person hurt me. I don't know if we can be okay. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. There can be healing in that relationship that makes the relationship stronger than it was at the beginning. And that's what Paul's talking about here when he is saying that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. I love what Paul does here. Paul is in Ephesus. They are in Corinth. Paul receives word that there are quarrels between them, that there are contentions between them. Paul does not behave in a shady or in a duplicitous manner here when he addresses this situation. He doesn't say to the Corinthians, hmm, you know, I heard through the grapevine and, you know, someone told me. No, he says, look, Chloe told me, okay? It was Chloe that told me this. If someone comes to you and they're like, hey, brother, did you know that so-and-so is blah, blah, blah? Like, oh, really? Okay, let's go talk to them. Hey, listen, this brother just told me this about you. What's going on? Right? It eliminates the danger of gossip because the person who said it is just as accountable as the person about whom it was said. Does that make sense? Paul doesn't say, oh, someone told me or a little bird said. No. Paul's like, look, I heard it from Chloe. So what's the deal? Right? I heard from those in Chloe's household that there are contentions among you. Now I say this. In other words, he's going to describe the the nature of these contentions. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. In other words, they were breaking out into their little camps building up their favorite Bible teachers, right? And I, I hear it sometimes even today. You know, you hear, you hear people, oh, well, oh, yeah, I really, oh, I, I, I'm, of, I'm of Jack Hibbs. Yeah, Jack, man, that's my guy. No offense to those of you who are, because I know there are a lot. Oh, I'm of Mike Winger. I, I prefer my, or, or I'm, of, I'm of this person, or I'm of that. You know, there, we, have, we all have our favorite Bible teachers, don't we? I have mine too. I love listening to David Guzik, right? 
I love listening to a bunch of guys. David Rosales, man, that guy's amazing. Great Bible teacher. So it's okay to have teachers that you prefer over other teachers. But those preferences, and that's all they are, friends, our preferences should not divide us, right? They should not divide us as believers in Jesus Christ. But they were dividing the Corinthians. They were actually having arguments about this, and it was causing divisions. I mean, some are like, oh, I'm of Paul. Maybe they said that they were of Paul because it was Paul who had planted the church there in Corinth, and it was Paul who was the apostle to the Gentiles. Maybe some of them were saying, I'm of Apollos because they loved his powerful speaking style. Apollos had come through Ephesus. He knew of the baptism of John. He didn't understand the way of grace perfectly. And Priscilla and Aquila, the friends of Paul, who he had made tents with there in Corinth, had pulled Apollos aside and more accurately explained the gospel to him. He had received that instruction from this beautiful couple and had gone off now to Corinth where he was ministering the very things that he had learned from them but he was doing so in a very powerful way with great rhetoric and wonderful speaking abilities. And so because of his charismatic delivery, perhaps, there were those in Corinth who were like, oh, forget Paul, man. This guy's a really great speaker. We love listening to Apollos teach. And then there were others who were like, well, no, no, I'm of Cephas because, you know, he's the one that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build the church. And he was the apostle to the Jews. So we're going to follow Peter. But then there's that other group who were like, oh, no, you're all wrong. I'm not of Paul or of Apollos or of Cephas. I am of Jesus. I'm much holier than you, right? I've got it right. Each of them thought that they were right and that the others were wrong. And it was causing divisions. Look, we've got some divisions even today. You've got Calvary Chapel Global. You've got CCA. You've got these people and those people. You've got people who will go online and criticize various ministries right? And it is appropriate to hold one another accountable to the scripture. It is appropriate to hold one another accountable to doctrine. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I am saying that there are some things that we can agree to disagree on and still have fellowship together with, right? In the essentials, we must have unity. In the peripherals, we must have liberty, but in all things, we must have charity or love because we're not to return reviling with reviling. We're not to return evil with evil, but with love. Amen? And so we are to pursue unity. We're to try to avoid dividing if we can. And as much as it is possible for you, live at peace with all men, the scripture tells us, right? And so Paul is saying, listen, I know that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? In other words, he's saying, okay, you like Paul, you like Cephas, you like Apollos. Christ isn't divided. We're all serving the same Jesus, right? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's saying, why are you taking my part in this discussion, right? I didn't die for you. Christ died for you. Your loyalty is not to me. Your loyalty is to Jesus Christ. You were not baptized in my name. You were baptized in Jesus' name. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And then he has this little aside where he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Oh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. So he's from, oh, yeah, 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 I also, I'm Stephanus too. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any others. Look, if I baptized them, I don't remember it. Paul did not baptize in his own name. And baptism was not a part of Paul's personal ministry that he really emphasized a great deal. Now, does that mean that the believers in Corinth were not baptized? No, it meant that the guys that Paul baptized were the ones who then would do the baptizing. Did you know that any Christian can baptize someone? Did you know that? You don't have to be the pastor. Sometimes someone will come up and say, listen, my, 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 my teenage child, they're, they're getting baptized. C- can I do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can do the Duncan. Go right ahead. Hold them down as long as you like. <laughs> I mean, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. 
For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. This in no way minimizes the importance of baptism. Paul's simply saying, look, I had a purpose. I had a mission, and my job was to preach the gospel. Amen? Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. Amen. Amen? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, I want you to recognize that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who are perishing and there are those who are being saved. Now, I want you to notice both of those are ongoing forms of the verb. It's not those who perished and those who were saved. It's those who are perishing and those who are being saved. It's speaking of the trajectory of an individual's life. And the trajectory of that individual's life is determined by how they have responded to the message of the cross. Amen? Those who look at the message of the cross and say it's foolishness, they are perishing. Those who look at the message of the cross and they say it is the power of God, they are being saved. Amen? Now, something that you could easily miss in our modern translation, because we're not reading this in Greek, something that you could easily miss is the meaning of the word message. The message of the cross. The word for message there, are you ready for this? is Logos. The Logos of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but the Logos of the cross is the power of God to those of us who are being saved. What is Logos? Or maybe I should say, who is Logos? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word is Logos. Logos means Jesus. The Logos of the cross is the Christ of the cross. And the Christ of the cross, Jesus, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Oh, you believe in Jesus? What's wrong with you? Are you so foolish? Why, why, why you actually believe what the Bible says about Jesus? You believe that somebody died and that they rose from the dead? You believe that? Really? What's wrong with you? Why are you such a fool? Guess what? That attitude, that person, they are perishing. The other person, Jesus, yes, the power of God for my salvation, amen. The, the sacrifice that was made for me, that person is being saved, amen. So my question is, what is the trajectory of your life? Are you on a trajectory that brings you into deeper and deeper fellowship with the message of the cross? Or are you on a trajectory that implies that you look at the message of the cross as foolishness? Where is your relationship with God as compared to where it was a year ago? Can you look at your life and say, yes, I am being saved? Or do you look at your spiritual life and say, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I'm perishing? What is your response to the word of God. Now, does that mean that those of us who are saved will never experience times of, of regress, times when maybe the world has got its hooked into us and we're struggling? Of course, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not calling in to question your salvation. I'm calling in to question the trajectory of your life. Amen? And I'm encouraging you to examine the trajectory of your life. And as you examine that trajectory, if you find that it is headed in a direction that you think is not where God wants you to be, I want to encourage you to follow the instructions that Jesus himself gives to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Go ahead and turn there with me, and this is where we'll close today. Revelation chapter 2. Now remember the book of Corinth, uh, the book of Corinth, the book of 1 Corinthians is being written by the Apostle Paul from Ephesus. 
And now, some years later, the Apostle John is transcribing a letter from Jesus to that very same church, the church in Ephesus, from which the letter of 1 Corinthians was being written by the Apostle Paul. And Jesus says in chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That imagery is essentially who holds the messengers of the churches in his hand, the angels of the churches in his hand, and the one who walks among the lampstands, or in other words, the one who walks among the churches. And here's what he says. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So he has a lot of good things to say about this church here in Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Listen, as believers, sometimes we can get into this rut where we are just going through the motions, right? Get up, pray, go to work, go home, do whatever we got to do, go to bed, get up, read our Bibles, maybe, maybe not, go to work, do what we got to do. Sunday rolls around, oh, got to go to church, so we go to church. We're doing our religious duty, right? And yet our heart is not stirred. Our heart is not enlivened by the working of the Spirit. It, it's not touching us the way that it used to. That's what was happening here in the church of Ephesus. They were doing good works, but they had lost their first love for the Lord. Verse 4 again, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The first thing to do is remember. Remember. If you find yourself in a dry and desert place in your faith, if you look at the trajectory of your life and you say, you know what, I'm stalled out. I know I'm being saved. I know that God is faithful and that he will get me where I need to be. But I also recognize that I'm not moving along that trajectory. I'm, I'm stalled out. And the problem with stalling out as a believer is that you don't stay where you are. As a believer, if you stall out, inevitably you begin to regress I've often compared the Christian life to walking up a down escalator. I used to work at a mall, right? And you, you know how that is. You, 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 you go in, into the mall and you see the escalator. And if it's not crowded, every once in a while, you'll see a kid break away from his parents and try to run up the down escalator. Come on, how many of y'all have seen that? Now, you know, as well as I do, that with the strength and energy of that youthful individual, they will, if they persist, make it to the top, won't they? They will because their legs can pump faster than those steps are moving down. But if they stop to take a break halfway up, what's going to happen? They're going to slide right back down. They're going to regress. And sometimes the Christian life is like that. If we're continually progressing in our faith, the weight of the world, the weight of our flesh pulling down on us, it will be overcome by the power of the Spirit that is working in us to get us to where we need to be. But if we stop moving, if we come sedate, if we get comfortable with where we are and how much we've grown or ever get to the point where we think that we've arrived, inevitably, the flesh reasserts itself. The world begins to pull on us. Satan attacks and slowly but surely we begin that descent back into our worldly attitudes and behaviors. And so the first thing that the Lord is telling this church in Ephesus is remember, right? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. If you are not today closer to the Lord Jesus than you've ever been before, I want you to remember what it felt like when you were walking closely with him. Remember the joy. Remember the strength. Remember the spiritual insight. Remember what it felt like to walk in close fellowship with the Lord. That's the first thing you need to do is you need to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. What does repent mean? Repent means have a change of mind, a change of heart, and a change of direction. You know, I, <laughs> I'm going to tell a story about an eight-year-old right now. Last night, if she was here, I'd owe her $5. If you're watching, 
I owe you $5. She and mom stayed at home, but I know they were watching online. So if you're still watching, I'm going to owe you $5 after this. That's the deal I have with all my kids. If I ever reference them as a sermon illustration, I have to pay a royalty and give them $5. <laughs> it, it keeps me accountable for not using them all the time, right? And it lets it be like, oh, dad's talking about me again, too. Oh, dad's talking about me again. I get five bucks. Um, I do usually pay up, don't I, Ian? Oh. I got a 20 in my pocket for you right now, right? I probably owe you. Must be present to win. No, I'm just kidding. But yesterday, I, 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 I go, she's spending, she's spending the day at a friend's house. And I go to pick her up, and she's, 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 Really, she has a hard time sometimes with transitions, right? And so she gets upset and she starts to cry and she starts to pout. And we get in the car and we're driving home and she says, Dad, I'm sorry that I was pouting. That was great, right? But then she kept on pouting. <laughs> and I'm like, if you're really sorry, then you need to stop. Well, repentance isn't just being sorry. That's remorse, not repentance. Repentance is when I am sorry, I feel remorse, and that remorse leads me to change my behavior or change the direction in which I am heading, right? So the first thing is to remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and the second is to repent, and then, he says, and do the first works. And I like to say that is repeat. So it's the three R's. Remember, repent, and repeat your first works. Amen? In other words, recommit yourself to that trajectory of following hard after Jesus Christ, walking in unity and fellowship with other believers. Amen? And if we will do that, God is faithful. And on that day when we stand before Jesus Christ, upon his return, we will be blameless. Amen? Amen? Not because of what we do, but because of what he has already done. For he, the message of the cross, is the power of God. And as Paul wrote in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the compassion that you have shown us. We thank you for the message of your apostle to us and to the church in Corinth that we are to walk in unity together as we seek to follow you. Lord, please help us not to be those who consider the message of the cross foolishness who are perishing but help us rather, Lord, to be those who are being saved through our faith in the message of the cross. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We turn from our sin. Lord, we remember the joy that we had when we were new in our faith. And I pray, Lord, that you would revive that in our hearts today. And if there's anyone here today, as every eye is closed, as every head is bowed, as every believer is praying, if there's any, I'm going to ask two questions today that I'd like you to respond to. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I have always thought of the message of the cross as foolishness, but I don't want to perish. I want to turn from my sin, turn to God through Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness that is available through him. If you are here today or if you are watching online today, I want you to know all it takes is a decision. You've got to make that decision to follow Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin and turn to God. Through Christ Jesus, you can be forgiven for your sins and you can receive the free gift of eternal life. The Bible tells us that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that you confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved you will be saved. That is the message of the cross, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, died upon the cross for our sins, was buried, and that on the third day he rose from the grave, and that through faith in him we can receive the forgiveness of our sins and the gift 
of eternal life. And if you will do that today, if you will put your faith and your hope and your trust in him and confess him as your Lord and Savior, the scripture says you will be saved. Amen? But there are also those of you here today who've done that, who've made that commitment to Jesus Christ, who, who are saved and who are being saved. And yet when you examine the trajectory of your life, you recognize that you're not growing closer to God, but you've actually been drifting from him. I want to encourage you this morning to remember what it was like to follow hard after Jesus, to repent, to turn around and start following him faithfully again and that you would repeat those first works that you did. Read your Bible, spend time in prayer, fellowship with other believers, strive to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and let the joy of the Lord be your strength again. That is my prayer for you this morning. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts, you know our needs. And I pray, Lord, that you would work in us that which needs to be accomplished, that which can be accomplished only by you through the working of your spirit in our lives. We yield ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.